well. Uh, without further ado, uh, Reverend Alante.
chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, commencing at verse 18 and dropping down to verse 23. And when you have it, please stand for the reading of God's Word, Matthew 8, commencing at verse 18 and dropping down to verse 23. Difference makers are individuals who are insightful and impactful. They go beyond the call of duty to ensure that people's lives are made the better. For instance, firefighters and paramedics go out to fight fires, rescue individuals, and ensure that those who are sick will find wellness. In 2020, nurses and doctors have been making rounds, giving treatments, and being essential workers to ensure that COVID-19 comes to a halt. And earlier this month, poll workers and ballot counters made sure that people were able to cast their votes and that their votes were counted without any alleged voter fraud going on. Amen. These and many others are difference makers. But there's another difference maker, and this difference maker is far greater, far better, far wiser, and far accessible than any this great difference maker is none other than our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. And through chapter 8, he displays that he's the difference maker for all situations because he cures the untouchable by cleansing the leper. Yeah. He speaks yeah. in, his, in, in the inaccessible by sending a word to the centurion servants house. He heals the incurable by touching and lifting up Peter's mother in law. The point that I'm conveying is that Jesus makes the difference yeah. and changes our situation. Yeah. Whether it's by a word or a touch, he specializes yeah. in things that seem impossible. And he can do what no other power can do. Oh, but we are not walking with the disciples. Yeah. And they are getting ready to avoid the ship, to depart, and to the other side. These men have watched Jesus make a difference. Make, make a difference for other people's lives, but now they're about to realize how Jesus can make a difference in their lives. Yeah. My brothers and sisters, can I tell you, no matter what comes up against you, Jesus is able to make the difference. Let's be honest, life is full of tough, toilsome, and terrible situations. Life is full of challenges and disappointments. Life is full of misery, mishap, and misfortune. Every time we turn around, it seems like there's bad news after bad news after bad news. Yeah. But the good news today is, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're up against, no matter how long you've been dealing with your oh, situation, oh. Jesus makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. How you know he makes a difference? We can tell a man to lift up his rod and stretch forth his hand over the Red Sea. He makes the difference. Yeah. Yeah. If you can allow a 16 year old boy by the name of David to stay down, a big giant with all us stone and a slingshot, he makes the difference. If you can tell a man by the name of Naaman to go watch seven times in the Jordan River and he'll be healed of his leprosy, he makes the difference. If he can go down the street of fish and weeds, get five by the Lord and two pieces of fish and feed five thousand, he makes the difference. If he can take spit and dirt and run on a blind man's eyes and tell him to go watch the pool of Simone, he makes the difference. I know he makes a difference because there's no sickness he cannot heal. There's no problem he cannot solve. There's no pain he cannot conquer. There's no 
key. He cannot be there. No internet. He cannot be there. There's no door. He cannot open. And I wish I had a few folks in here. Yeah. They can say Jesus makes a difference. The only reason why I'm still standing in 2020 despite of what we have to go through is because Jesus makes a difference. The only reason why I haven't lost my mind yet is because Jesus makes a difference. The only reason why I haven't given up yet is because Jesus makes a difference. Finished teaching and healing. Uh -huh. He has just given you the sermon, his longest sermon and discourse of time recorded, and all of the Bible known as the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. And he even performed some miracles, but now he's about to tell his disciples to get to follow him onto the sheep. He wants to depart to the other side, and his disciples did what any other follower of Christ would do when they followed him into the sheep. But when these men followed him, the unplanned had to be unavoidable and unexpected and unaware what happened. And these men found themselves in a storm like none of us. My brothers and sisters, it's good to point out that these men were always disciples. Before Jesus called them to be his partners, mothers, and his followers, these men were fishermen. So therefore, they were seasoned fishermen. They were professional fishermen and skilled fishermen. So therefore, they knew the waters. They knew how to handle themselves in these types of situations. And they most likely been out in storms before. But this is so likely. That's good. The yeah. text says the waves have swept over the boat. Yeah, yeah. Now, brothers and sisters, in order to learn about the significance and the uniqueness of this storm, you have to focus on the source and the call of the storm. Because the source and the call can help you understand what this storm cure and its purpose. Yeah. And one of them was the natural cause. You have to understand that the disciples did not travel by an ordinary body of water. Yeah. These men had traveled by way of the Sea of Galilee, and the Sea of Galilee was an unusual body of water. It was about 13 miles long, 7 miles wide, and 680 feet below sea level. And these seas were surrounded by hills and mountains, and in the hot summer sun, the water from this sea would evaporate. Yeah. And if the ash stream is met by cooler air from the Mediterranean, there will be a great terminus, there will be great conflict causing an unexpected storm to arise. Yeah. So therefore, we know there's a natural cause, but also there's a supernatural cause. And my brothers and sisters, when you deal with the supernatural, you have to understand that it's broke up into two parts. Yeah. You have to understand that there's the devil's side. Yeah. And you got to understand that there's the divine side. Mm -hmm. Let's deal with the devil's. Let's look in this text. You can notice that the disciples didn't encounter this storm mm -hmm. until they followed and obeyed the command of the Lord. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, you got to understand that some storms can come just because you are following Christ. Yeah. You've got to understand that some yeah. storms are caused and induced by Satan. And with that call by Satan, you've got to understand that he isn't going to bother somebody he already got. Yeah, he wants right. those who are aligned with the will of the Father. Yeah. He wants yeah. those who are under the blood stained down. He wants those who have declared for God I live and for God I die. He wants those who have put the world behind them and the cross before them because he's going to come out like a woman, huh? yeah. seeking whom he may devour. Satan will send storms to interrupt your devotion with God. Satan yeah. will send storms to hinder your walk with God. Satan will send storms to get you off track with your walk with God. But can I tell you, when you're willing to follow Jesus, yeah. despite what Satan goes, that the Lord will surely have you yeah. by your side. Yeah. Yeah. Not only was well, that the devil's side, but you have to understand that there was a divine side. My uh, brothers and sisters, you have moon walkers and stuff. We learn in Sunday school. Yeah. We all learn that the Lord is on our prayers and meaning he's everywhere at the same time. Uh -huh. We learn that he's omnipotent, meaning that he's all power. Uh -huh. We learn that he's omniscient, meaning that he's all knowing. Uh -huh. So therefore, Christ is all knowing. We can understand that this storm did not catch him on God. This storm did not catch him by surprise. Yeah. It was not accidental. So therefore, we can come to the conclusion. That it was Jesus who led them into the storm. Yeah. And the question that comes to mind is why did God allow these disciples to encounter this storm? And I would like to suggest to you that sometimes God will lead you into some storms, not to destruct you, not to damage you, nor to harm you. 
But sometimes God will use the storms of miserable marriages, the storms of broken and bruised relationships, the storms of fake friends and fake people, the storms of unshadowed dreams and uncontrollable nightmares in order to get you to where he needs you to be. In order yeah. to get to you. Yeah. And you bring it home to you like this. Before you can get lemonade, the lemons have to be squeezed. Before you can get wine, the grapes have to be crushed. Yeah. Before you can get to your gold, it has to be put through the fire. Before a seed can grow, it has to be put in the darkness. Yeah. If you feel like you are being squeezed, yeah. Yeah. if you feel like you are being crushed, if you feel yeah. like you are in the fire, if you feel like you are in the darkness, you are in a powerful place because that's God the family. Yeah. Yeah. But he'll use storms to show you something. Mm -hmm. Because there are some things that only storms can teach you. Mm -hmm. and brother and sister, sometimes the storms can show you who your friends are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that little rascal told you, told you he's your waste of cool. He told you that he's your ride or die. He told you that he's going to ride with you through thick and thin. But as soon as the storm came, yeah. they can't die. Yeah. But sometimes storms will show you who you are. Yeah, as right. human beings, we are like tea bags. We don't know what's been on the inside of us. We really don't know what we're really made of until we've been placed yeah, this in our form. But also God will put us in some storm to show us who he is. I'm going to see you got two people that want to talk about God after what they heard instead of what they know. No. And can I tell you, you don't know. Like I know what the Lord has done for me. Yeah. You got to understand, if you've never been sick, you don't know he's a doctor in the sick room. Yeah. If you've never been in trouble, you don't know he's a lawyer in the cup room. Yeah. If you've never been lonely, you don't know that he's a copy keeper. If yeah. you've never been hungry, you don't know he's bread when you're hungry and water yeah. when you're thirsty. Sometimes God will put you into some stars to show you yeah. who he is. Yeah. But not only did these disciples encounter the storm, the second that the disciples exemplified that they were scared. Mm -hmm. Jesus has just not allowed his disciples to encounter this storm. Mm -hmm. But in the latter part of verse 24, the text says, Jesus was a sheep. Mm -hmm. And that was a song that came out by a fellow named Kevin Gates. He said, I don't get tired. <laughs> when I approached this text, I thought Jesus had the same type of mentality. But we have to understand that Jesus is fully God and fully man aside from sin, all in the same body. Yeah, yeah. We have to understand that throughout his throughout the Bible, his humanity and deity is displayed. In his humanity, a child is born, but in his deity, a son was given. In his humanity, he got hungry, but in his deity, he's the bread of life. In his humanity, he wept over the death of Lazarus, but in his deity, he raised Lazarus up out of the grave. In his humanity, he paid taxes just like ordinary people did back in the Bible days, but in his deity, he got tax money from a coin that was in a fish's mouth. In his humanity, he died. But I'm so glad that in his deity, he got up. And here in this text, he shows us his humanity because he's asleep. Yeah. And you gotta understand that Jesus was asleep because he had finished a long day of preaching, teaching, and healing. And he has now grown weary in the work, not of the work, so therefore he needed some rest. But the reality of Jesus being asleep did not bother these disciples. But the reality of Jesus being asleep in the storm while they got desperate caused the issue. These disciples began to think that Jesus did not care about the storm that they were facing. And because of that, the storm caused them to fear. The storm caused them to be frightened. The storm caused them to be scared. But when these disciples were in fear and panic, they did the right thing. But they did the wrong way. Because the disciples awoke Jesus. Called upon the Lord and said, Lord, save us. We perish. That was the right thing. Because whenever you find yourself in a storm, you have to seek the Savior. Whenever yeah. you find yourself in an insurmountable and unexplainable situation that you don't know what to do and you don't know who to look to, you must seek the Savior. But they did it the wrong way because there was something in their heart that didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. These disciples' heart had trembled with fear. After the disciples had awoke Jesus and said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? Oh ye of the Lord. And my brother and sister, if you want Jesus to make a difference, mm -hmm. you have to restrict fear from his eyes in your heart but allow faith to come in. Yeah. But faith is that fear, isn't that? Yeah. But with fear is that faith. Is that? Yeah. And you got to understand that there are some things that fear can't do that faith can do. Yeah. Fear can cause you to try to figure things out on your own, but faith 
faith will lead you to talk to Jesus. Fear will cause you to give up, but faith will cause you to persevere. Fear will cause you not getting a job, but faith will have you cashing your first check. Fear will have you worry about paying student loans, but faith will have you rolling across the stage getting your degree. Fear will have you rolling around miserable and unhappy, but faith will have you walking around with the joy that the world can give. And the joy that the world can take away. In this text, these disciples did not exercise their faith, but they exemplified their fear. My brothers and sisters, keep in mind that I said these men were fishing. They knew the Lord. They knew the Lord. They knew how to handle themselves in these yeah. types of situations, yeah. but they feel. Yeah. But not only that, these men had walked with Jesus through chapter 8. They saw how Jesus was able to make the difference while working and others while doing so. Jesus gave them some hope to hold on to. Yeah. But yet, they feel. Yeah. But my brothers and sisters, there's something in this text that blew my mind away. You mean to tell me you have Jesus, yeah. the one who can make the lame walk? The one who can make the dumb yeah. talk to death, the one that can make the blind see on the board, but yet you're afraid. Mm -hmm. and my brothers and sisters got to understand that when Jesus is on board, you have every reason on why you should have faith. Yeah. And you have to understand that faith is not confidence that trials will come, but faith is confidence knowing that no matter what winds or waves comes up against you, you Jesus is right there in the boat with you. Yeah. Yes, I know you're in the middle of a pandemic. Yes, I know you may be dealing with the sickness. Yes, I know you may have money difficulties. Yes, I know you may be having to deal with some stuff in your home and in your marriage. Yes, I know you have struggles on your job. But don't you worry. Don't you fear. Don't you stress. Why? Because Jesus is on board. Amen. Jesus is on board. He has everything under control. Yeah. I like how the hymnologist just put it like a sheep. That's tossed and driven, battered by in anger. See, when the storms of life are raging and the fury falls on me, I wonder what I have done mm -hmm. to make my way so hard to run. But I say to my soul, yeah. take courage. Why? Because the Lord will make a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But not only did the disciples encounter that storm, not only did the disciples exemplify that they were scared. But lastly, the disciples experienced the surrender. And in the text you see that after the disciples had a go to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see that Jesus had got up and he condemned them for their people. Yes, sir. But then you can look and realize that he got up. Yeah. And he spoke to the storm and there was a great calm. Yeah. So therefore, the disciples experienced the surrender. Oh, yeah. And therefore, we are self-confident, knowing that Jesus can calm our storm. Yes, sir. But let me suggest to you that that is not the point of the story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because when you look in verse 27, you can see that these disciples had asked a peculiar question. Yeah. These men said, what now a man is this? Yeah. That even the wind and the sea obey him. Yeah. And you have to understand that these men were good Jews. And the only God they knew was the God in the Old Testament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Known as Yahweh. Yeah. So therefore, they did not understand that Jesus was not an ordinary man. Yeah. But God himself was in the boat right there with them. Yeah. And my brothers and sisters, I come to the realization that uh, I can gain the serenity mm -hmm. because the man that's on board is not an ordinary man. How do you know he's not an ordinary man? Yeah. How do you know he's not an ordinary man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because the same authority that belongs to God yeah. is the same authority that belongs to Jesus. Mm -hmm. I know he is not an ordinary man because he's the one that can step on the platform of nothing.
wasn't an alpha. He wasn't a key dog. He wasn't a captain. But he's still an alpha and omega. In order that a man, because he's the one that can turn water into wine. He's not in order that every man. Hey! 